go. And uh, we will have this posted as an archive in approximately about two hours on the Daily Effects site as well as the YouTube channel. Uh, it's been a pretty climactic past 24 hours. I mean, we could even extend that back as there's a bit of posturing ahead of FOMC yesterday, but we have a lot to talk about today. As usual, this webinar is all about you, ladies and gentlemen. So any setups you have or pairs you want to take a look at, go ahead and fire those my way. I'll do my absolute best to answer as many as I can when we get to the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Uh, I need to show a quick risk disclaimer before I get onto the live charts. And that risk disclaimer is here. I'm going to leave it up for about 15 seconds and then we will proceed. So uh, which of these big moves are you guys following? I mean, we had a huge breakout in gold, fresh all-time highs in the S&P. Pretty decisive move in USD as well. Big break lower there. Pete says, I ran. Yeah, that's a big item in the headlines today too. And these types of issues could get a little bit messy because this may have helped propel that bid in gold a little bit more, right? We had that first gasp of strength in gold around yesterday's sell-off, yesterday and last night's sell-off in the U.S. dollar. And then, of course, that Iranian news or the U.S. Iran news a little earlier this morning. I would be surprised if at least some of that didn't filter into gold prices, helping to further support that bid around those fresh five-year highs. Been a pretty, pretty amazing run there so far. But uh, that is more than 15 seconds. So we're good to go on a on the disclaimer front. Give me one moment. I'm just going to clean up my desktop so that I can put 100% focus on these charts. All right, here we go. Uh, so right off the bat, USD. Uh, as I was mentioning a moment ago, pretty big move that's shown up here. Uh, as I mentioned on Tuesday, I was looking at this from a bearish perspective, largely with the anticipation for prices to come back down and retest this trend line, maybe a little bit more. So far, we've seen that a little bit more aspect, as you see where prices are cutting right through that trend line projection and heading right back to a really big price at 96.47. This is the 23.6% Fibonacci retracement of this major move, the 2011 to 2017 major move right in there. Perhaps more importantly than that, this is a level that's had some very recent importance in the U.S. dollar. I'm on a weekly chart right now, but you can see where the same price came in to help mark the swing high back in August. Soon became support. Notice the way that it's cutting off these weekly candlestick bodies, catching a bit of wick action right in here in December. Came back into play as resistance early January. We climbed back above, and then it became support. Now, it was support again last week, uh, last Friday to be exact. Actually, that was two Fridays ago now. But uh, as the U.S. dollar was folding lower earlier this month, and this was right after the Jerome Powell comments that came in on June the 3rd. But right after those comments filtered into the market, we saw stocks rally, stocks bottom and then rally, gold prices shoot higher. And then the U.S. dollar came down and tested this really big level of support around 96.47. Now, there's another element of support that's down here, making this a nice little confluent batch to be watching on the chart. And uh, real simply, it's just the 200-day moving average on top of that Fibonacci retracement plus that trend line projection. So it's a big, big zone down here. And you can see we're just tickling that 200 DMA right now or earlier this morning with the low. Um, so the natural question we, when we get something like this is, is one of continuation potential. And I try to look at it very simplistically. There was a big motive reason that this whole thing boiled out and that motive could definitely continue. That being said, it's not really prudent to be selling whilst at lows when there's a valid case to be made for support very nearby. So there's really two ways of handling such a scenario. One is you could just take a step back, draw your line in the sand and say, hey, you got to do that before I'm going to look to get short. And for that strategy or that approach, I would be looking for a break below that 96.47 Fibonacci level that had come in to provide the June swing low just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, alternatively, you could look to play a pullback in the effort of finding some lower high resistance, all in the effort of getting that stop above that prior swing high so that if we do end up with the initiation of a fresh downtrend, great. If we don't and it reverses, for whatever reason, we see dollar strength come back in the next couple of weeks, at the very least, loss mitigation could come to the forefront as the priority. 
so at this stage, if looking to play a pullback to resistance, the one level that really sticks out to me is around that 97 handle. You can see where we had an attempt at bottoming back here earlier in, in June, but it did come back into play as resistance turned support when prices were working their way back up. Notice it did not stop prices on the way down early, uh, last night, earlier this morning. So a check back to resistance at that level, at the very least, would get me a bit closer to this week's swing high, thereby keeping the door open for short size strategies, looking for a retest in 96.47. So I'm still having a difficult time walking away from a bearish bias here on USD. Um, and one of the reasons for that is the longer term setup that's been building here. And I shared this with you a couple of times over the past few weeks, but coming into Q2, we were looking at an ascending triangle formation with that 9770 level, the same level that helped to set this week's swing high, showing up as a triple top. Notice we had this inflection in November, another in December. We tested it again in March and failed. Now we finally did break out of that pattern in April and then again in May, but buyers couldn't really do much after that. Notice where we topped out here like 98 and a third. And then early June is when we saw that lower high come into play or late May is when we saw the lower high come into play. And then that's the Jerome Powell speech right there, July 3rd or uh, June 3rd. And then prices ran right back down to that key level of support. So this to me is still the line in the sand. But again, taking a step back, that ascending triangle formation, which is often approached in a bullish manner, has turned into a rising wedge. And this is often approached in a bearish manner. Looking for reversals on the thesis that if this was a legitimate bullish theme or scenario, then we should be seeing the same type of excitement near highs or near resistance as we're seeing near the lows, and we're not. Buyers get bashful near resistance, aggressive near support. Now it looks like that formation is about to give way in a bottom side break below 96.47, further opens the door for a bigger move. Next levels I'd be looking for are around that 95.53 level that came in as a swing high just a couple of days ago, or excuse me, uh, last, that was last year, 18 June of 2018. Uh, below that, the 95 psychological level is pretty big. Big swing high back here in October of 2017. Notice this grouping of wicks right in there. We even had a nice little support bounce back in January off that level. So if we could cut below 96.47, those are the next near-term objectives that I'd be looking for here on this USD chart. Now, with that being said, and just as though, and, and just as I looked at on Tuesday, just because of a bias on the dollar, it doesn't mean that I'm going to put all my eggs in one basket, looking for the dollar to drop against everything. Because frankly, I think there's some areas where dollar strength is still more attractive, even with this breakdown potential that we're, that we're seeing on the weekly charts. Um, let me jump into one of those right off the bat, cable. So I looked at cable on Tuesday. As I shared with you, a pretty big level of support had come into play around 25 and a quarter. That is the 14.4% Fibonacci retracement of this major move. Still scrolling out. It's a long term major move. 1980 top down to the Plaza Accord bottom, February 1985. That 14.4% Fibonacci retracement is right in there, 25 23. There's a few other things going on there. A few other areas of note. Give me a quick second. I got a shorter term chart here I can share with you. So there's another 14.4% retracement right at that same level. And that's simply just taken from the 2015 swing high down to the 2016 swing low. So a decent area of confluence. Then we combine that in with a trend line projection that's taken from the 2017 and 2018 swing lows. Currently hoping to hold support right now. But if we get a little bit tighter, you can see where prices have basically just catapulted right back into a zone of prior resist, uh, excuse me, prior support, turn of resistance. And this runs in a chasm between 2671 and 2721. So about a 50 pip range. In between there is 2705, another Fibonacci level of note. And interestingly, this morning brought a Bank of England rate decision, uh, BOE. Like most other developed central banks are harboring some form of bearishness or dovishness with forward-looking projections. And so that could be motive to continue short side themes around the British pound. So if we get a hold of this resistance, particularly a hold below that, that prior swing higher on 2760, then the door can remain open for short side setups, trend continuation setups, if you will.
as a way to look to fade that dollar strength. Presuming that we may get another bounce off of that support level, maybe it takes three or four attempts before it finally gives way. But at this stage, this thing is still set up for short side continuation potential with the way that it's holding resistance within that very key zone of prior support. There's that 2705 level helping to set the October 2018 swing low, 2671 helping to set the August swing low. It's a good zone. On the flip side of that, Euro dollar. And I may have shared this with you ladies and gentlemen in the past, but whenever I get one of those themes, especially on like a social media platform where I'll talk about a move and then I'll get people telling me how I should trade or respond to that move. It's usually those areas where I want to ramp up the conviction because if somebody's going to straight up out of mouth, tell me I'm wrong on a setup that hasn't played out yet. I know they probably don't know what they're talking about. And it's a pretty good indication of retail sentiment, right? Usually an area where I want to ramp up activities. And I had that with the Euro earlier this week. Coming into this week, I was looking at the Euro for topside, largely under the presumption that we had hold higher low support. After last uh, or two weeks ago, saw the initiation of a higher high. So I was just trying to catch that higher low in Euro dollar. Now, I, I know the, the very general opinion here that Europe is not in a healthy spot politically or economically. As a matter of fact, we heard a little bit more about that a couple of days ago. Mario Draghi had a speech, got all dovish again. But really, at this point, is that any surprise? Like his nickname is Dovish Draghi. It's what he does. And so that speech basically just got us a slightly deeper support level. Where we were previously hanging on around the 112.12 level, we just perched down to 111.87 and we held. Held into yesterday. And then yesterday's dollar weakness started to take over. And as it's continued, we've had that continued pattern of higher highs and higher lows now after that revisit to a very key zone on the chart. At this stage, it's a pretty rough spot to try to trigger fresh, uh, fresh topside exposure because we're looking at a greater than 100 pip stop. I mean, it'd probably be around 120 to 130 to do it right if looking to get below that prior swing low. So this near term move is stretched. It needs a pullback before topside exposure could get attractive again. One possible way of doing so is going down to a shorter term chart to try to look at look for swings that could allow for tighter stop placement, say around 1270 or maybe 1250. But reasonably speaking, this would be an area where a pullback could be sought tomorrow looking for that prior zone. It runs between around 1250 and 1265 to come back into play. Notice we did get a quick check of short term support last night. But this isn't something that would necessarily rule this area out, for me at least. And looking for another element to higher low support off of prior resistance. And then looking for prices to finally retest 113.50, followed by 114, followed by that big picture zone of longer term resistance that runs between 14.48 and 115 flat. Now, if we get back up there, maybe the longer term short side of the matter begins to get attractive again. My thesis on the euro at the moment is that because of the long-term downturn that's been there, this thing is still very ripe for short squeeze scenarios. Even though the European economy is not healthy, even though the euro is not a currency that I would want to be long of long-term, right? This wouldn't be an investment type of thing. It'd just be a quick trade in and out, trying to take a ride as opposed to looking to invest. But I think if we could take out that 115 level, you're going to see a lot of trailed stops get hit. At that point, there's likely going to be quite a few more folks on the sidelines. And that's often when price will have the ability to finally break down to fresh lows. Notice how we had that bear trap that I talked about in May around that 111 handle. Right? Everybody in the world's looking for 110, so of course it didn't happen. But I think if we could take out 115 first, then it could start to reopen the door for as such. A case in point, if you look, and this is just a pretty good example, if you look at this run that we had in August, and then another run that showed up uh, in uh, April, excuse me, and then another run that showed up in August. Look at the way that this batch of resistance just barely ticks above those prior swings, because you know that there was probably a lot of stops that were sitting there off the 118 handle, just a very obvious swing high when this thing pitched lower. So there was likely a lot of trailed stops using that level. Notice how we just barely tick through it. Bulls were even willing to drive for a few days later 
but eventually that trend just comes right back and then we were able to crack down to a fresh low i'm looking for something similar here in euro dollar now especially if we end up with scenarios of a continuation of dollar weakness pete says i think you're spot on even with easy uh econ being poor yeah and i think there's you know a and, and so I think there's a chasm in, in, in traders where experience really brings humility, right? Because when you do this stuff long enough, you realize that your crystal ball is a misnomer. It doesn't exist. At best, we might be able to get the probabilities on our side just a little bit. But when the entire world is looking at something in the same direction, in the same way, and if everybody that wants to get short is short, then how in the world is price going to move lower? It's not. You need fresh sellers in the market to push prices down. And I think that's still somewhat of the scenario here in Euro dollar, where that short uh, or, or where that bearish trend is so long in the tooth. There's so many folks that have just trailed stops waiting for it to break down to 110 or maybe even parity that the sentiment needs to get reset before it can finally break down to a fresh low. At least that's what I'm looking at on the matter. Okay, moving on. Dollar cat. Okay, so I was previously looking at this for upside. That is smashed. Notice how we broke right back down below that 3250 level and prices are now trickling even below the 132 handle. This might be an area, and this is still at the early stages. So at this point, I still need to move forward very carefully, but we may be at an area where a full on trend flip is, is, is the next theme of interest. Right. Uh, and the reason that I say that is because not only do we have the Fed's dovish flip yesterday, we also had a really strong inflation print out of Canada. It came out at 2.4 percent versus the prior month print of two flat. Now, at the earlier Bank of Canada rate decision that happened in late May, if you remember, the Bank of Canada got, quote unquote, dovish. It wasn't dovish as much as they just got less hawkish. The Bank of Canada removed a key statement in that for, in that. Uh, a key phrase in that statement that alluded to returning rates to the neutral rate, you know, a la Jerome Powell in October. So when they removed that phrase, it was seen as a dovish twist in the fact that the Bank of Canada was no longer looking at rate hikes in the effort of normalizing Canadian interest rates. Now, that led to a quick topside breakout. This thing topped out 3565. And that's when the proverbial music stopped. Because even though we had some CAD weakness, dollar weakness came in and overpowered that thing. Initially drove down to a support zone that I've been following. It even gave a decent little bounce here in the first week of June. But since then, a, f a run down to a fresh low, fresh near-term low, I think this was two-month low at the time. Bounced back up, and now we have another fresh low to work with. So just taking a step back on a daily chart, and given the drivers that are on the headlines, this is something that may keep the door open all the way down to like a 130 print or maybe even a little bit deeper. But again, it's a new theme. So I don't want to just chase it, cross my fingers and hope. Instead, what I want to do is I want to take that prior zone of support. It's a real chunky zone, like 50 pips, 32 and a half up to 33 flat. Helped set the lows in late March. Helped to carve out these lows in early April. Came back into play to set the lows in early June. You know what hasn't happened yet? Prices haven't tested here for resistance. So a pull back into this zone keeps the door open for short side setups. Now, I don't know if we're going to get a pullback to that zone before 130, uh, before 31 and a third comes into play. But that, for me at this point, would be the first destination or the first target. Below that at 30.65 and then below that at the 130 big figure. If we take out 130 or we test 130 and... Uh, decent amount of time, then this is something that I'm going to want to keep open for a little while and wait for it to just slink lower. There's a big confluent level or a zone down here around the, uh, just above the 25 handle. Now, it's likely going to take some work before something like that comes in. Like I'm on a weekly chart now and you see the type of move that I'd be looking for in that case. But we have to play for steps one and two before we get to steps 14 and 15. Steps one and two are reload, breakdown, Touch of 130. That's what I'm looking at in dollar cat. Dollar yen. So this is one that I've been following for short side setups for a little while now. And 
uh, my next target on this thing is at 107. So we're getting pretty close. Uh, there was also a Bank of Japan rate decision last night. Again, like a chorus, Kuroda was dovish, uh, threatened to break out more stimulus tools if needed. But again, that wasn't a surprise. We knew that stuff already, right? The change here, the recent change is the Fed getting a bit more dovish. Now that resistance zone that I've been following that runs between 108.47 and 108.70, it's done a really good job of helping to hold the high so far in June. Uh, notice where there was like almost a full two weeks of grind at that level before sellers were finally able to win out and push this thing down. At this stage, I do like keeping the door open for, for continuation. I hate the idea of selling at lows after we did get so much range bound price action. So to trigger fresh positions or to look at fresh shorts at this point, about the best that I have is a pullback to the zone that runs between 107 and three quarters and 107.95, little 20 pip zone in there. Uh, what that would do is keep the door open for stops above the June swing high, while also being able to initiate first targets around that 107 level. Now, I think that yen strength can be extracted elsewhere. For instance, looked at euro dollar a moment ago, and as I shared, I think a lot of folks are harboring a bearish euro view. I don't want to look at that against the US dollar because the US dollar is getting slammed right now. But for those that are so inclined that really want to push the envelope with euro shorts, euro yen could probably be a more attractive place to be. Hey, Karan, there you go. Karan's in here today. Remember that 122 level I was telling you about? Came in to help mark today's swing high. Pretty cool, right? Taking a step back, daily chart. And after that significant surge in strength to start the year, we've basically been looking at varying forms of consolidation. Uh, this was my top trade of the year. My initial target was at 120, and we took that out in like the second day, second trading day of the year. But at this point, you can see where the main obstacle is this trend line projection is taken from the 2019 swing lows. That January swing low connected to the May swing low. I don't like selling at that level, especially when there's a support swing so close by. Further, I wouldn't really be able to justify the risk if looking to get stops above that 122 handle. So about the best thing that I have on this right now is looking for a short side break below 120.79, the swing low that came in in late May, and then looking for a run down to the 120 psych level. Be a breakout trade, but if looking to take advantage of some of this recent risk aversion, I think this would be a workable setup or a setup that could remain as attractive. Alternatively, a 122 level can remain as usable as long as sellers are able to hold resistance there. But you see somewhat of the quandary right now on the four hour chart. We're in an area that has been tested a lot very recently over the past couple of days. So this is not the level that I want to automatically look to get short, hope for a break, and then look to manage the trade after that break takes takes place. Kron asks, so euro yen, euro is weaker than yen. Yes, I was looking for euro strength, but only against the dollar, you say. There could be some other areas to pick on euro strength. Um You know, it's again, it's not kind of a tenuous situation because uh, the reason I like euro dollar is because of the elongated downtrend, the short squeeze potential. But I could likely fit that in elsewhere. Like, um, I don't know. Let me think about it. And then when we get to the q and I'll be happy to make a trip back to, uh, to short side euro setups. All right, Aussie dollar. So this is another setup that I'm keeping on the sidelines for dollar strength. On the sidelines now, because the resistance zone that I was looking for was just cut through like a hot knife through butter. And I was looking for a resistance to hold around 69 to 69.11. And then when I go down to like an hourly chart, you can see where this thing has very healthy topside trend construction. Higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows coming right on off of the resistance zone that I was looking for. So at this stage, I merely have to direct my, my gaze higher. 
And so I'm looking at like 69.54 to 69.60 prior to a little batch of support that had held the lows on the way down. If I could get resistance back in that area, it keeps the door open for stops above the June swing high. Looking for that prior zone support to come back into play around 68.60 to 68.75. But for now, short-term price action is showing me the opposite of what I want to see. You look at this on a four-hour, though, this is where it could start to get a little bit more interesting. Because notice where that big four-hour bar from um, 0200, 0600 this morning prints. And then we had a doji show up on the 0600 to uh, 10 a.m. bar. And now we have some element of turn. This could end up becoming a morning star formation, but I really need to see... This four hour candle dip inside of that prior resistance now support zone to A, finish off that formation, and then B, give me some indication of topping potential here in this near term, uh, let's call it a bounce and Aussie off fresh five month lows. But I still like the short side of this one. I just need the setup to align a, a bit better before I'd actually be able to push the setup. QB dollar. So, I was looking for short side in Aussie. I was looking at reversal potential in Kiwi on Tuesday. And you can see where we caught a pretty nice bounce off of that support zone that I was looking at. Higher low right off the 65.10 level. And then continue drive. So I'm keeping this on the short side USD radar. It feels a little bit stretched. You see where we had all these uh, underside wicks? It's a good indication of buyers coming in to offset offset sellers that are trying to catch a reversal here. It's still a little bit too unsettled for my taste. The area that I'm focusing on is at 65.40. That might be a little too far away. I might not end up with an entry and that's okay. I'm perfectly fine going into the weekend flat here, reassessing after uh, next week's open. If I really wanted to push the envelope, there might be something to work with around 65.62. Notice where we had pretty good equalization right back here between around 65.60 and let's call it 65.85. Might be something to work with in there. All right, I'm gonna start getting to some commodities. Wow, gold. And there it is, right back up, testing that new fresh five-year high that was just set earlier this morning. Um, Not a lot to be said about this, right? I mean, this theme started to price in. Uh, give me one second. I got an article that I just published that I think would uh, have a bit more detail than what I'll be able to share on the webinar. But um, that breakout started in the final days of May, and buyers have largely retained control of that theme ever since. Uh, I just published this article I'm putting in the chat box uh, literally a couple hours ago. Very much along the lines of what I'm looking at right now, which is basically when you get a move like this, there's really only a couple of ways of handling it in a professional manner, in my opinion. Clicking buy, crossing your fingers, hoping, praying, maybe even making a sacrifice, not a good way of going about it. I think more interesting is trying to take a strategic approach on, uh, strategic approach on the matter. For me, there was a huge zone of resistance in here was between 1357.50 and 1366.06. Right in here. And this helped mark the five-year highs in gold prices. Notice that we have not been at the current level since, I mean, we basically have to go back to 2013. Right, we had this swing in March of 2014. That came in very near where we're at right now. But I started talking about this in early May as we started to see congestion inside of congestion to the point where a big breakout had started to brew in one direction or the other. Back in early May, I didn't know which side this was going to come out on. As evidence has stacked up over the past couple of weeks, well, before June, it started to show more bullish potential than bearish, especially given the rejection that we had around 1266.10. And that thing has just leapt up into the stratosphere at this point. We even caught a decent bit of resistance off that trend line projection last week. And this week, full throttle. So 
at this stage, love the move, hate the price. There's a couple of different options that I have. One is playing a pullback. We have that prior zone of resistance that runs between 1357.50, 1366.06. I could wait for the perp to return to the scene of the crime. That 1357.50 level even helped to set last week's swing high. As of yet, we haven't seen prices pull back to test that zone. If I wanted to be really aggressive about it, I could take that March 2014 swing high at 1375, and I could repurpose that for support potential, looking for a more mild pullback, establishment of some support, and the effort of looking for prices to throttle higher and go back up towards that 1400 retest. This zone even remains workable. It runs between 1342.74, 1346.75. The latter of those prices had helped set the February swing high. The former of those prices is the 76.4% Fibonacci retracement of this major move. The 2013 to 2015 major move, right in there. Also a level that has had some recent importance to gold price action. Right in there. So I can even use that as an additional area of support. Now, another natural question when we see a move like we've seen, some folks want to trade a reversal off of it. That could be possible here if we do get a decent amount of protection at these highs. We don't have it yet, right? Because you can see where price just jutted right back up towards that prior swing high. But like, let's say for instance, this hourly bar closes like it did. And then the next hourly bar shows another failure to break above that high and that high. We could be seeing the initial stages of bulls getting more bashful, a bit more trepidatious about extending the move. Because think about it, and going back to what I said a little earlier, to continue driving a move, we need fresh entrance, right? At this point, it's difficult to justify stops if I got to put uh, if I got to put my stop level fifty dollars away. This move has come in really far, really fast. So if we do see that continued diminishing of, of bullish momentum or of excitement around highs, as indicated by continuation of lower highs, then that reversal possibility could be there. Uh, but I think as opposed to playing for a reversal, folks that are looking at the short side of gold, first just want to play for a pullback. You know, maybe looking at like a near-term target around that 1375 level. Maybe something even a little bit tighter, 1381, 1385, something like that for a break-even stop. So that if that breakout does continue, you don't have a short-term trade become a long-term problem. But it's a legitimate move in gold. And to me, this is saying something that a lot of currency pairs aren't saying right now, right? Because if we go back to the central bank dynamic that we have, where it's a race to the bottom and all of these central banks are talking their currencies lower, it puts the top side in gold back into play. Now I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, an interview for Paul Tudor Jones, where he had mentioned he's looking for a break of 1400 to run straight to 1700, utilizing very much, very similar logic of looking for devaluation of fiat to amount or to allow for continued top side in gold. Okay, one last market I wanted to look at for today is US oil. So I've been following oil for a couple of months now. Um, the month of May saw a pretty decent breakdown develop. That's shown right in here. We've seen the establishment of support come into play around a very key zone. I looked at that on Tuesday. It runs around 51 and a half. And now prices are right back up to that prior support zone. It was between around 57.34 and 57.85. A couple of different ways to handle this one. This is something that may have some short side reversal appeal. Uh, go down a little bit tighter, hourly chart. You can see where there was a couple of different candles that try to take out that resistance, but weren't able to do it. So we have some pretty decent wick cover around that level. So for folks that want to look to get short, relatively tight stops, again, playing for step one of a pullback that may turn into step two of a reversal. Alternatively, for folks that do want to look to get long, there's a very adequate zone of prior resistance that had previously shown some support that has not yet come back into play as support potential. That runs between 54, 49, 55, 57. And that could keep the door open for topside continuation approaches in oil. Hold the support there showing a higher low. And that, my friends, is what I have for today. I want to see what kind of questions you ladies and gentlemen have. 
don't hesitate to let me know anything trading related. Uh, Cordell had some questions, but he said I've already answered them. Um, I'm going to keep these on the sideline because there may be other folks that have those questions, and I might bring them back here in a couple of moments. We'll see what uh, what the pace of the other questions that come in are. Cordell always asks good ones. Um, from Pete, amazing move already. PTJ may be spot on. Yeah, when a guy like that shares his hand, it's, you know, he's usually got good motor for doing so. Although with, you know, in, in, in full disclosure, I, I've heard some of these Titans, I think it was Stanley Drunken Miller, maybe a year or two ago, I try to call a top in stocks. I may be getting that off, but, you know, I, I still try to take that type of commentary with a grain of salt. But like I was speaking about a couple of weeks ago, when I see something like that, that confirms my views. It's really, really difficult. It's a challenge for me to remain as open-minded as I want to be around the matter. It just builds even more conviction behind whatever it is that I'm already looking at. Um, Mr. Richard Heath, which USD pair are you playing for USD weakness play? Uh, many have issues themselves, e.g. Euro, Sterling, Aussie, Yen, etc. Oh yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. I think maybe the easiest way of of summarizing it is I'm looking for the currencies that have been beat down the longest, the most that might have the least room to go. Um, you know, in Euro, I, 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 I think it's more of a short squeeze type of scenario. And now as we have a new factor that's getting priced in that could take on a bit more importance with, you know, a double shift at the Fed. You know, I, I think that's something that continue to show topside potential in the pair. You know, and, and I'd said this a lot back in April and May, like bears had every opportunity to take take this thing away, you know, and they didn't. Like there's all this support underneath these oh, there's all these targets underneath. But, you know, bears seemingly lost control of the wheel. And, you know, it's it, it, it's not for a lack of trying. Right. You can see all these upper wicks sellers responding to these resistance tests. But, you know, just like I had shared around that rising wedge formation a, a little earlier, the same type of thing happens around support or happens at lows with a falling wedge where you're getting greater pitch on resistance than you're at than you're getting at support. I know that support trend line is terrible, but I'm using it just as an indication of of momentum at the time. But when you're not getting that same type of stretch near lows where bears are bashful at lows, but not at highs, that's usually a move that's right for reversal. So, you know, I think we just need to take out some resistance, reset sentiment, and then that thing will be ready to fall. Um, USD weakness, though. Uh, let's continue moving on. Dollar yen. So, again, Bank of Japan has been so dovish for so long that I, I don't really know what they can say or do, uh, you know, outside of, you know, maybe another fresh round of stimulus or a surprise for another fresh round of stimulus that that would really inject much more negativity into the matter. It's kind of like that old that old story, boy who cried wolf, right? If you get the central bank that's always crying crisis, crisis, my currency's so expensive, my currency's so expensive. Well, all of a sudden, when there's another bigger central bank out there that starts singing that same tune, they're the ones that's going to get the attention. And I think that's kind of where we're at with 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 some of these markets, dollar unit uh, uh, included. So I think this is another area that uh, could be pretty attractive for that theme. And then Kiwi dollar, I mean, this thing's just been really, really beaten down. Um, my motive for looking at the long side of this was purely technical in nature and the posturing that we had at lows. But now that this thing has worked for a bit, it's something I can keep the door open on. Look for some continuation there uh, in that theme. Uh, Karan says dollar CAD weekly trend line up. Yeah, there's another one down there, but at this point, I believe it's just a two point touch. I believe it's just a two point touch. Yeah, 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 yeah. By two point touch, what I mean is see, I'm going to initiate the line right here. I'll even magnetize it, but I'll initiate the line right here. And then I set it right there. And I really just have those two points of touch. I don't know if there's something here. I don't know if buyers are watching it. I don't know if I'm just randomly connecting to very random spots on the chart and trying to see something that might not exist. You know, for me to get excited about a trend line, for me to even keep it on my chart, I need to see at least a couple of touches, at least a couple. I mean, I want to see two touches on top of initiation. Give me 
three points of contact with the trend line, or at the very least some posturing around that or something, right? Good example here on the one that I'm using on DollarCAD, point of initiation, point of touch. Notice where this projection gets a good amount of grind off of that trend line. You see where these wicks are all coming in in respect to that trend line. That to me, this big batch of support is like the market tapping on the shoulder saying, hey dude, that's the trend line that we're watching. Now it doesn't mean we're gonna get a bounce if it comes back into play, but it does mean it is some element of context that could allow me to see things a little bit differently, right? So when it comes back down, I know, okay, well, I don't wanna sell here. That trend line's just come back into play. Maybe wait, you get a bounce, sell off resistance, then look to work with it. But when you find a good trend line, it'll often continue to come back. On the weekly, I just don't know if that's a good trend line yet, because I only have those two points of touch. Um, I could draw it here as well. Right, but I, and now I have the same kind of story where we didn't really get that same same kind of grind back here in February, right? Still just a two point, uh, a two touch trend line. Uh, from Pete, I subscribe to the idea that you're all to run up near 115, which would have DXY squeeze out of 9550 for the short squeeze. Yeah, I mean, I could definitely get on board with that. Um, you know, if this rising wedge really does fill in, it, it should have more potential. Uh, longer term, the area that I think is pretty attractive is the same zone that helped to catch the bulk of the second half, uh, the second half of last year support in USD. It runs between like 9386, 9420. But yeah, I, I could definitely get on with that thesis. Uh, Mr. Vinnie Palmer, hello James, sorry to be late. I'm screwing up the undo of my USD neutral portfolio. Hello, well, Vinny, had a boy, Vinny. Staying balanced, beautiful. And, you know, I, I sometimes get comments from folks like, oh, why don't you just pick one side? I mean, that, to me, in my mind, if I just put everything in the short side of the dollar, everything in the long side of the dollar, I'm basically just gambling on one thing. It's not strategy. It's not trading. It's just hoping. And while I'm all about the power of hope and the intention of goodwill, I know that markets don't care about my intention of goodwill or my hope. <laughs> they want to squash my little dreams as quickly as they can. And that's okay because that's what the game is. But I don't go in with the expectation that anybody else cares about my hopes or dreams. So I don't expect markets to. Instead, so just try to strategize around it and do like Vinny. Keep some balance. A little bit of balance. Uh, from Pete, I'm thinking most yen pairs are eventually headed to that January flash low even this year. I, I think I dropped this statement a little earlier in this webinar. <laughs> I got it from Law and Order Criminal Intent, but the perp often returns to the scene of the crime. I got that from uh, Vincent D'Onofrio. Plays a great role in that series, by the way. But uh, uh, what I mean by that is when you get a big point of emphasis for a breakout, prices will often have a tendency to try to return to that price doesn't always happen in a straight line. It doesn't always happen in a clean manner, but it's like a big beacon on the chart that will have a tendency to come back at some point, you know, and, and I think with those flash crash lows, I think you're on the right track for sure. Um, you know, that Euro yen low, like 119.03, I think that's especially vulnerable. Uh, dollar yen's low, this, this, this is going to be a bit tougher because it was all the way down to like 104.30, I believe, 104.60. I mean, that's going to be a, no, that's right, right in there, 104.80. That's going to be a tough nut to crack because, you know, we got to break the 105 psychological level. We get down there and we have that big, big 2018 swing low. You know, take a step back on that weekly chart. If we do break down to that level, something is very, very wrong in the system. And I know, Pete, you probably remember this. It was like summer three years ago where I was just grinding off of that 100 level off dollar yen. It might, it might be back into play at some point this summer. You never know. You never know. Uh, for Pete, that gold monster move has to be telling for the greenback, don't you think? And no, I mean, so first and foremost, there are a lot of very smart people in this stuff that do ascribe some USD value to what's, what's happening in gold. I'm not one of them. I try to look at the markets into 
independently of each other. And the reason is because there are a lot of other currencies that trade in gold. There are, here's another, I guess, kind of analogy, uh, oil with CAD, right? We can often see these themes aligned just beautifully where Canadian dollars getting more expensive, oils jump in, you know, all going alongside stronger levels of Canadian inflation, et cetera. You know, and there will be times where, you know, the dollar's putting in big moves and that's transmitting very well through gold. But, you know, one of the reasons that I'm, I don't want to say skeptical, but a little bit more reserved on that right now is because of the themes that have shown so far this month in gold. Gold has basically been in one direction, just straight up, whereas the dollar hasn't. You know, the dollar initially initially took a dive, found support, bounced, and then is going right back again, perp to the scene of the crime, right? So we've had like now three different themes in the dollar so far this month, but only one in gold. I think that what we're seeing now is, and I don't want to sound uh, hyperbolic, but you know, somewhat of a repricing of the fiat regime, so to speak, right? Because there's not really a central bank that's that's hawkish at this point. And so what we're seeing in gold, the move we're seeing in gold is very reminiscent of what was happening, you know, back in the in the good old days. When the printing presses were running at full steam. Now, we're not quite there yet, but similar type of uh, a similar type of backdrop. I think I even have one of these set up with a monthly chart. No, heck, we can just do it right here. It's like that Bill O'Reilly clip, right? We'll do it live. Can't say the first part of it, but we'll do it live. All right, so this is what I call the, the master move in gold. Master, just the long-term move, the low from 1999, drawing that up to the high of 2011. It looks a lot cleaner from this vantage point. We're basically talking a 50 retrace. Actually, those October 2015 swing lows come into play. The price is beginning to recover. And so the exciting aspect of this would be indicating that we're seeing something similar to that real big thrust in 1999 that ran all the way into 2011, something like that coming back into play. After what's basically been like seven years of consolidation i'm on a monthly chart so it's a long-term type of deal but you know a few of these different things align in a similar direction right now so that's the secondary major move with a pullback from that major move notice that 1380 level right in there that has helped hold the five-year high we're breaking above that right now So, I mean, just putting it in scope, we could be in the midst of something very, very big. Be with another point, all the Paul Tudor Jones disciples are buying the yellow metal. Yeah, yeah, they're looking on the horizon, looking on the horizon. Gary Diebel says higher low isn't in yet on gold. Uh, I mean, it's had quite a few. It's been a really big month. Um, the last one I was able to catch well was a 13, 1991. And it's just really been rallying since then. Um, but yeah, we, we're at a breakout now, you know, so the, the the backdrop has shifted a little bit, at least, you know, here, here we are, we're back above 1390. Not that one, that one. There we go. Yeah, I mean, so the breakouts happen, we're still posturing your resistance. I mean, I know that a lot of folks are just looking for, you know, that pat on the back that says, hey, go ahead and get long, but... You know, that's not me. It's not the way that I approach these things. I'm not going to encourage others to do the same. I would rather miss out on an entry, you know, for for being too prudent than lose capital for being not patient enough. Um, but the area where I think that higher low could develop was that really big batch of resistance that held the highs for like five years. Uh, from Pete, I don't think people are seeing how significant this gold move is is it's huge look at the monthly wow and i think this was before i actually pulled out that monthly chart but yeah it's it's really significant the reason i was you know the counterpoint that i had on tuesday was that we've seen other instances like this you know like this is a weekly chart so we're looking at a strong run 
December, Jan December 27, uh, 2017 into January 2018. Similar deal back here in January of 16, June of 16. You know, each of those instances saw prices turn around in that resistance zone. You know, but we've cut through that now like a hot knife through butter. And that's something. That's meaningful. Very, very meaningful. Gerald Smyther. Yeah, I apologize that I haven't gotten this far yet, but how about the S&P 500 hitting all-time highs? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's – I mean, <laughs> it's notable for sure. The problem that I have is, is what can I do up here? I mean, this thing is so extended that I really don't have any strategy that I can implement at least strategy that I feel good about. Um, but, I, I, you know, I think the Fed was fairly clear in in their messaging, which is they don't really care about the dual mandate as much as they care about keeping the recovery on track. And I think that's the reason this bid is returned with, with, with such vengeance in June after a bloody month of May. This is why market timing could be so, so costly for uh, a lot of retail investors. You know, they see one dip like that, they sell out and end up selling a bottom. And then, boop, right back to the top. Uh, from Bipin Chandra Engineer. Bipin, good to see you, my friend. Uh, yen pairs, what will make yen weaker? Well, what would traditionally make the yen weaker was already, that already happened last night and it didn't work. So, you know, I don't really have a good answer for you. It's one of the reasons I'm looking for strength there. Um, you know, it doesn't mean it can only move in one direction, but, you know, maybe we need to hear the Bank of Japan get a little bit louder on that future stimulus front. That might be it, but at this stage, I really don't know. Uh, from Quran, uh, dollar yen below 107, what do the text tell you, please? It's dicey because, uh, you know, basically all we have underneath that is that flash crash low. You know, I'm looking at that 107 right there around that 23.6 fib retracement. You know, there's a 14.4 there at 106.03. That could usually be a pretty good level to look for reversals off of. So if it does, you know, continue in a clean manner, that's where I'd want to stop the short side approach and look for a little bit of a bounce. But, you know, there's not a lot between 107 and the flash crash low, which makes it a dicey area to be operating in, in my opinion. Let me check this one out. I might have a few other levels to work with. 105.34. Okay, well, a couple of additional reference levels. 106.40, 106.65, Yeah, 105.34. That's a good level to operate off of. That's the 23.6 of the June 15 to June 16 major move. Right down in there. And then there's a bit of confluence here around 106.65. Um, this is the Abinomics move, 2011 low, 2015 swing high. Notice 38 two is right there at 106.65. A shorter term move. Yeah, it's right around 107.85. That helped. Hold the support, a little bit of resistance earlier this morning, but there's a related level down there at 106.41. Yeah, so that might be something to work with below 107. Uh, from Quran, dollar CAD, it going up potentially regardless of possible uh, possibility of oil also going up. Yeah, that correlation isn't tight enough for me to, to base the strategy off of it. I mean, if I get them both at support, right? As in, in this case, it'd be loony at support, dollar cat at resistance. If I get dollar cat at resistance with the oil at support, then that's something that I might be able to strike on. Like I, I'd done one of those plays, uh, I think it was a couple of months ago. Something like that could work for me. But if it's not there, I'm not going to try to fit a square peg in a round hole. That correlation just isn't tight enough for me to 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 take to take as a given assumption. Uh, from North BizNet, uh, can you take a look at the SP500? Do you expect a pullback? 
I think it's hard to expect one when prices are running as aggressively as they are today. But I think the way that I would say it is I'm not going to get long in one or I'm not going to add to anything unless I do get a pullback. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to abandon my prudence and, and, uh, and strategy, you know, all in the hope of, or all in the hope of joining on a really strong move. The level, the nearest level that I was looking at for a pullback after this morning's open, it's already come to play. That's that 88.6 retracement at 29.33. I don't really have a lot of great context outside of that. As you can see where that prior all time high 2942 is what's coming in to help set near term support. Um, if I could get this back to 2903 to 2910, that works. That's something that I can, can more easily wrap my mind around. And then at the very least, I can manage my risk off pretty simplistically by looking at this June 12 swing low and trying to get my stop underneath that and looking at a return to the highs. Uh, from Quran, Aussie dollar, despite trade wars, talk ram talk rambling, still up constructive. I'll just be honest, I don't care about that stuff at all. I mean, it's a factor, right? It's a factor, but it changes so quickly that in my mind, basing a strategy off of that is kind of like, you know, it's the tail of the dog, you know? So I give it some attention, but only as much as I have to. Uh, but yeah, I'm definitely not going to look to get long or short on something because, oh, trade war should do this or trade war should do that. I don't know. In all honesty, if 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 tariffs do go down, I don't even know what the long-term impact of those are. You know, uh, most of the research that I've read is, is pretty non-conclusive. So, you know, it's like everybody else just taking it day by day on that trade war topic. Taking the setups as I see them. <laughs> Vinny Palma, you got it, my friend. Perhaps we're in a new chapter. It could be, you know. Um, I was talking with another analyst on our team yesterday, you know, cause after the Fed, he was like, dude, that was so boring. And I was like, oh, wait on that. Give it 24 hours and then tell me it was boring because, you know, the big meat of these moves often happen as it get, gets priced in when Asia comes online and when Europe comes online, that's exactly what's happened here. It ended up being a pretty notable event. And that said, and the reason this is relevant is it's only with hindsight that we'll understand the significance of what happened or lack thereof. So to me, it doesn't really pay to go into something betting, oh, this is going to be a big Fed meeting. I'm going to look for the dollar to get smashed to smithereens. Well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I'm just going to look for ways to risk the dollar to try to make two. And if I could fit that into an area where I might be able to win on, on either scenario, even better. Um, from Patrick Smith, great question. Give the dovish bias on the dollar. What's the best way I can net, uh, I, I can not let that affect all of my trades? Just try to stay balanced around the dollar. Try to take an equidistant amount of risk, and and that could be extrapolated in a few different ways. So you know we're either talking smaller position sizes for wider stops, larger position sizes but tighter stops, but make sure that that risk is roughly equidistant on both sides. And then you could allow your risk risk management, your risk reward ratios to do their job. And that's one of the big reasons that I'm fastidious about finding areas, again, where I could try to risk a dollar to try to make two. You know, now, am I going to get a one, two on everything? Absolutely not. I eat a lot of break even stops. A lot of times I'll get out, average out one, 1 1.25 to one, something like that. That's fine. I don't care. But if I'm putting myself in spots where I might make less than I have to risk, that to me is a bad investment. It's a bad trade. It's a bad way of doing business. And I just don't want anything to do with that. My ability to predict the future is nil. I know that. Yeah, I employ largely technical analysis, but I also use fundamental analysis. But in my mind, it goes back to that phraseology. History often rhymes. It rarely repeats. So what I've seen in the recent past, it might continue. It could also change. But the big benefit in being able to analyze these things is it shows me areas where I could, again, try to risk a dollar, try to make two, so that if that history continues to rhyme, great. And then if it doesn't, that's when reversal setups come into play, even wider risk-reward ratios, because my probability of success is usually going to be lower, because now I'm looking for something new to happen. And if i got to bet on status quo or something new, I'm usually going to try to get on the side of status quo as much as I can. Uh, from Alex Zardes, uh, 
hopefully I got that correct. Uh, where would you suggest a long intrigue go gold? I'm, I'm sorry, Alex, I don't give suggestions or recommendations. Um, it's one of those scenarios where I end up taking on all the risk without any of the upside. I'm happy to show you what I'm looking at. Um, if you're looking to get long, I'll give you like three areas that I'm following right now. 1375.15 was a big level. That was the March 2014 swing high. It's just so close that I, I would want to see more than just a touch there. I'd want to see a touch combined with the build of support, maybe a couple of hourly bars or two hour bars showing underside wicks around that level, you know, similar to what happened up here at 1380. But 1375.15 could have that. A bit lower, I have a, a wider body zone that had helped hold resistance for like five years for, since that 2014 swing high at least. Um, this I'd be a bit more open to, taking just a quick touchdown, but you know, I'd still wanna see some establishment of support as opposed to a quick wick that just touches the zone and then rallies. And then the last area, I think if we break back below this, something has shifted or changed. And at that point, it, it's time to reinvestigate the strategy altogether. But that runs between around 1342 up to around 1346.75. Okay, I got to take the last couple questions of the day because I have went out of time. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 Vinny, I like it, I like it. So we're looking at, uh, we're asking about uh, short side approaches on the Euro a little earlier. Euro CAD, Vinny's got a good good suggestion here. Um, but question from Vinny, James, on the flyer, Euro CAD short side using follow on CAD inflation surprises and further disinflation in Europe. Thoughts on a downside break? Uh, from a fundamental perspective, that lines up really, really nicely, you know, because we've basically seen the Canadian economy as one of the healthier uh, developed economies, especially given the fact they're still showing some pretty decent inflation. I'll take a step back here. Yeah, that wedge is getting timed out. Those are all dirty trend lines, though, so I wouldn't want to base strategy off of it. I'd be a little more open to basing some strategy off of what I have here. Okay, so it's a weekly chart. We're looking at a longer term type of deal, but you could see where there's just like this kind of this chasm that's been in play for like the last few months. Like we're just now tipping down to test range support. But if, you know, it, it's kind of like I was looking at in gold in May, it, it, it's like it's banding very tightly and close together. It's ready to explode in one direction or the other for a downside break. And we've already just perched down below that 150 level. If we take out that Fibonacci level at 48 and a quarter, that it gives some swing lows back in October, then look out below, break of the trend line. And again, it's not a great trend line, so I don't want to base the strategy off of it, but it's, you know, it's, you know, a good guide, if you will. Um, and then there's like a full air pocket down here and it runs all the way down like 42 and a half. Stop point at 45. Notice we caught these two swing lows back in 2017, but I think that could be a good option if looking to if looking to get short the euro or looking to sell the euro. Okay, last question of the day. Uh, so this won't count. Um, but Bipen asks, what happened to your new wave webinar with you live on screen? Yeah, we're mixing those in. I think next Tuesday is my next one, and then I got another one the Thursday after that. So a little bit of mix and match. But let me know. What do you like about each? Send your comments and uh, I'll be happy to get them to the to the right folks. Okay, got to take the last question of the day. Uh, Mr. Richard Angelis, America and Europe are far from sound money policies. Austrian school of economics, longer term sustainability and trust in fiat currency wars will lead to dead and wounded currencies and loss of faith as major places to keep value and hence drives into stocks and other assets by those in the know. Look at the British and American comedies and politics and lies. I mean, straight up, I can't refute what you're saying. That's your opinion and you are more than welcome to it. Um, I, I do think that we have differing opinions on the matter, but I, I think here's the easiest way for me to summarize this or, or more my vantage point in, into what you're saying, which is for what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, it really matters very little how much rot is in the system 
because I have to be able to adapt regardless of what's there, right? When we do get these new themes or these new shifts or these new political paradigms or whatever, it's my job to find a way to work with it. And if I don't, if I can't, then I'm not doing my job. I'm just sitting there on my thumbs. So sure, there are a lot of existential areas that are potential crises right now. And who knows how the history books are going to remember it. But for me and what I do, I try to keep things very, very simple. I'm looking for a way to risk a dollar to try to make two. And if some of these themes come to life, then great. And if they don't, it's okay. I'm used to it. Take enough stops and you get a little bit immune to them to the point where you don't worry about it. And you're a little bit more free to trigger setups that you don't have as much emotional attachment to. And that's the way I look at it. Um, now on to the socio-political issues. I read a quote from Naval, Naval Ravikant, who's a guy that I, I'm a really big fan of. And this is probably one of the most successful guys that I know of in the world. I mean, he's not like a Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, but he didn't want to be. He's, I believe he's a billionaire. He's a, a Silicon Valley guy. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter. It's just at, and it looks like Naval, N-A-V-A-L. But he's such a bright guy. And I read a quote from him once that just blew my mind. And he said, the older I got, the more I realized that I don't understand how society should be structured or how, uh, how other people should live their lives. That rang a lot of truth with me. I don't know if it means anything to anybody else, but you know, the, the older I get, the longer I'm on this earth, the more I know that I don't have answers. I just have more questions. And... I'm just along for the ride like everybody else. So I try to keep it simple. Look for support resistance. Stop below, stop above, and then look for some drive. I know that's not what a lot of folks want to hear, but that is my secret little way of really, really enjoying my life. I'm not getting too caught up in what's in the headlines, what's in the news, because I promise you, it's going to get worse before it gets better. We have an election coming up in the States next year, and it's likely going to get pretty brutal. So just along for the ride. Look for opportunities as they come about. On that note, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody for your time. Uh, really do appreciate it. I'll be back next week. Like uh, I had said to Bipen a little bit earlier, uh, we will have one of those YouTube live webinars next week. So should be pretty awesome. Uh, Tim asks, and I got to gotta share, uh, can you please repeat that name that you said? I'm going to do better than that. I'm going to show you on the Google machine. This is the guy. Naval Ravikant. I am a huge, huge fan of this gentleman. Uh, but thank you so much for your time. Have a fantastic rest of the day. And as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.